Isle of Man game. Need I say more? I guess you want me to, right? I heard mixed reviews about T-T-I-O-M-R-O-T-E's first release, so I decided not to pull the trigger. Until now. Thanks, Gaben. And with that, here's my review of TT Isle of Man right on the edge too. Why not just call it Isle of Man TT 2.0, or perhaps Peter Hickman's Isle of Man TT, since he essentially owns the race now. TLDR time. TT2 is an absolute solid indie feeling Simcade stiff neck simulator with the best environments I've seen in dang near any racing game. Now for some physics. The first word that popped into my head playing was Simcade. It's not necessarily Midnight Club 2, nor on the other side of the spectrum with Rims Racing, but nestled right in between. Playing the game reminds me of a modern road rash due to the fact that you're really just threading the needle through Pacific Coast Highway, and I couldn't believe how much fun it was to pick up and play. This game in a way feels a lot like Rims, because it was made in the same engine. Animations, visual models, all look very similar. Even the fact that there's sparks at full lean. But the games are drastically different when it comes to physics. Rims is definitely more sim, and TTIOMROE2 is more arcadey which isn't necessarily a bad thing. The best way to explain this is that you can chop the throttle as much as you want and squeeze the brakes as hard as you can. Pull hard. It isn't quite as sensitive about it as Rim's jobby racing. Quick flicking happens much quicker, but the game has its own idiosyncrasies too. If the bike jumps in the air, it's a 50-50 chance it'll go flying a random direction you won't even expect. Going over bumpy parts of the road, the solution is to just be completely off the throttle. And shatter and head shake doesn't feel as natural as Ride Force physics, but you definitely feel the front if you brake late. You can also gun it out of corners at full lean without the bike sliding out from under you. During corner entry and exit, you can open and close the radius without punishment of the bike losing traction as well. As long as you don't run out of literal road, you won't really care about all the super sim stuff because of how intense of an experience it is attempting to go flat out on a road course. It makes your hands sweat and your neck muscles cramp up. It's the same sensation as Road Rash, looking way down the tiny little road, hitting 200 miles per hour and holding on for dear life when a blind corner comes up. Dare I say, this game gives you a glimpse into the sensation of racing in the TT, the super badass gladiators of our times. The reason why it's arcadey but hard is that during my first TT, I had a crash literally every single lap because you get in over your head and break a little too late, and that's all it takes. There is no margin for error. Every line, every bump, every curve has to be set up correctly. And keep in mind, it takes a good 17 minutes to get around the entirety of the Isle of Man. It was an absolutely exhilarating and frustrating experience, and I had a blast. That alone gives this game a big thumbs up, which makes me think, as someone with a lot of racing and racing game experience, it might not be very accessible due to the sheer difficulty of the tracks and speed, but not the physics. <laughs> Isle of Man, here I come. Assists are also not live. They're just a sub-menu in the options, which makes it confusing if you should use them or not because you can't experiment mid-race. Customization-wise, this game feels very indie in this department because there is no rider customization. Bike-wise, you have roughly five random liveries and the official teams you unlock. That's it. The default suit you see is the black RST one throughout the review. Also, all of the riders share the same model. Every rider's model is the Arai Corsair helmet and the RST everything else, including the boots I actually own. <laughs> For other riders, they've just slapped a coat of paint on them to make it look like they're wearing something different. The game also reuses real riders for amateur riders in career mode, so be prepared to race seven Bruce Anstey's at once. Likewise, Suzuki's 600s and 1000s are suspiciously absent from the lineup, except for the classic bike. You do get the TT specialties, like the Norton and the EBR, but they're not very good because you can't tune them unlike the regular production bikes. Also, the 2019 BMW is hilariously glitched, and they haven't patched it since 2020. Otherwise, the bikes look great, but lack customization. You can't change visual parts like you can in rims. Tracks? You have a lot of interesting road racing courses in this game. Ireland, Scotland, being Scottish! and the UK, and an airport course, and of course, the 37 mile Snaefell mountain course. And Ireland doubles as a free roam map. You heard me right. Free roam, baby. I'm king of the world, baby. That was a bad Duke Nukem impression. <laughs> now for the graphics. Besides the outdated looking player models and the asset pop-in, the environments are magical. Look at them. They make me want to turn the camera away from the race and enjoy the view. You want to talk about shooting above and beyond for a small studio? Whoever did the environmental design for this game should just do it for everything. I was constantly blown away by the vistas, the details, the weather, the absolute faithful recreation of the entire TT with all that foliage hanging over the road, the soft mist of the clouds through the trees, the sunset reflecting in your visor as you keep the throttle pinned over a crest, 
chef's kiss. TT2 also has an onboard view that I like, just like rims. It's that gyro camera thing. Sound is pretty good. The bikes sound decent, and I love the backfire sound when you shift. This game has a tier one sensation of speed. Second chef's kiss. Now for the meat. Career mode. You race from July to June, ending with the Isle of Man TT. At the beginning, you can sign up for a team, which is how you unlock certain parts for your bikes. Or you can go without a team and just pocket the cash. You usually choose between three events rated by difficulty, and you can interchangeably race a 600 or 1000 depending on what you got in the garage and what you signed up for. You can also race in the classic races if you buy an old bike. If you sign up for a team, you just use the team's skin for the main events, which is the Irish Road Racing Championship. You win signatures from these specific races by coming in the top three. Once you have five, the Isle of Man unlocks, or you can beat certain events. Either way, you'll probably have it unlocked by the end of the first season. Every time you beat a race, you get fans, credit, and perks. Perks are the very game part of the game that gives you certain game modifiers, like reducing the difficulty or adding weight to your bike. We're going for Tarka Squad. But I'm sure sim racers want to spit in my chocolate banana Cheerios for using them. But who cares? Sometimes it's nice to play a game instead of a sim. Like when dad chases you with the belt. You don't earn that much credit from racing, so you need to invest in real estate with the money you don't have. So it is a bit grindy to unlock those level 5 parts. Some are even locked behind riding for certain teams, and you'll have to meet all their objectives before the end of the season. You can instead buy lower tier parts through the store as well as other bikes. You also have access to the free roam mode that has challenges that unlock periodically, which is a nice little sideshow. The real reason you're playing career mode though is to unlock parts to help modify your bike in preparation for the Isle of Man, which is a min max process because nobody forgets their first. Nail bite. Next stiffening. TT Isle of Man. Not just any rims racing jobby. The whole goal on the narrow beautiful roadway is to push to your absolute limit. Your peak performance. Your inner Walter White. Or Jesse. In my friend Cody's case. Bitch. You actually need to channel your inner John McGinnis. Grab a pint and think three corners ahead. Develop your road racing spidey sense. Every single corner is blinded by trees. Oh, by the way, you're going 180 miles per hour on a road that can barely fit a K car. My first Super Sport TT, I was crashing all over the place. Then by lap three after my pit stop, suddenly it all came to me, like I was dropped on my head as a baby, and I pushed out a blistering 127 mile per hour lap on a ZX6. With two crashes still, Birkin's Ben constantly murdering my corpse. Suddenly, I was an Isle of TT wiener. After 64 minutes in the seats, it was amazing, and my Smash Bros basketball shorts were drenched with Road Racer Gooch sweat. Like a dog without a bone, I had to do it again. I grinded my second season out, getting parts for my old Beamer leader bike that hadn't eaten its engine yet. I checked with BMW about my extended warranty and hopped into the Senior TT, putting together two fantastic laps, with a bike in hindsight that I should have tested out more in free roam with the gearing ratios. Long story short, I got disqualified. Turns out, you can't enter Enter the pits at 107 miles per hour. I immediately jumped straight into the senior TT in anger with no perks at all, and yelled at my mom to bring me a chocolate milk because this was getting serious. One hour and 42 pulse pounding minutes later, I pulled a 16 minute 19 second lap out of my butt with an average speed of 132.6 miles per hour with a full time of 102 minutes and 30 seconds, which included at least two crashes every lap. I was a breadwinner. For the first time in my life, Peter Hickman gave me a good job, son. And finally, I'm not a disappointment to my family and friends. To give you context, Peter Hickman did a 135 mile per hour lap in 2018. Insane. If you want to watch the entirety of my Superbike TT run, it's up on my second channel. For those of you who want to see how it went down, and believe me, I went down a lot. I learned several things riding a Superbike in the TT. You need to push two laps and then pit below 35 miles per hour because getting fuel after one lap, you still wait the same amount of time as you would for two laps. So don't make the same mistake like I did. Also, your rear tire will be gone by lap two and things will be much sketchier. So maybe run that tire wear perk. Just not crashing is a Valorant feat in itself. There's also a hardcore mode which means one big fall can end your entire season. Finally, the AI. 
They're like the baby version of Rune's AI. You can smack them, they can smack you, they do put up a pretty good fight on some tracks, and I think they can carry more lean angle than you, but they're certainly passable. And they didn't ram me as much as MotoGP22's AI. Like Rims, it's more you versus the road. Multiplayer would be fun, but alas, none of my friends have the no shower for three days Smash Bro basketball shorts to play this game. He says they say it's something to be proud of. I don't have too much to say as far as criticisms go. I think if these guys got together with Race Ward and had a baby, we would have one hell of a racing game. And for the love of God, open world. Imagine a multiplayer lobby where you could just cruise around the Isle of Man with your bros. I will say, slow speed maneuvers are a pain, which doesn't make sense to me because when you're going 5 to 30 miles per hour, motorcycles are insanely flickable. But no bike game has gotten that down yet. And sadly, there is no photo mode. Anyways, this game is great. And the fact that you can buy it for a cup of coffee at this point means you sincerely won't regret it. Unless you don't like the game engine from RIMS slash TT2. That's it for this one. Thank you again to all my subscribers, patrons, and commenters. I know GP Bikes has been highly requested, so I'll probably be setting my sights on that next. Other thing I have on my radar is a tourist trophy retrospective. Since I got the PS2 emulator working, keep the rubber side down, and I'll see you in the next video.